Welcome to E3. This morning, <laughs> I want to talk about the church. All right, what is the church and what does that mean? Let me start by saying in the Old Testament, the church was a place. So they go to a place and they deify the place. But in the New Testament, the church is no longer a place. The church is a gathering of people. Are you following? In the Old Testament, till today, there are people who go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they travel to the Holy Land, in quotes, they feel holy. Because that place was deified as the headquarters of Christianity. But the church is no longer a place. All right? Um, when Moses met God in the burning bush, God told Moses, take off your slippers because where you are standing on is a holy ground. There are a sect of Christians, and they are Christians, but they practice that literally. They don't wear any footwear in church because they believe that where they are standing is a holy ground. But that has been abolished. Because what makes Ambi Royal Maki holy is not that it is Church of God mission. What makes this place holy is because you and I are here. When me and you leave this place, it becomes an event center. When we step into this place, we'll step into this place with our holiness. So the place is not what is holy. It is the people who are holy. To be holy is not a big word. To be holy simply means to be set apart. If you are a Christian and you have believed in Jesus, you are holy. You don't need to wear white garments to be holy. What makes you holy is that Christ has set you apart to show forth his own praise through your life. Tell somebody, say, I am holy. When you walk into a building, the place becomes holy. Not because the place is holy, but because you are holy. This is why our choir will not say, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. No, that was Old Testament. You no longer come into the presence of God. When you came to church this morning, you did not come into the presence of God. You came with the presence of God. So it's not about the place. It is about the people. Praise God. When Nebuchadnezzar went to take all of the um, glass cups and gold cups, sorry, in the temple and took the Israelites captive, when God appeared to Nebuchadnezzar at night to write on the wall, he told him, are you not scared? Don't you know that those, those gold cups are holy? My question is, what did the cups do to be holy? And if God could call cups and spoons holy, why would people think that they are unholy? The point being made is that you have been set apart. So when I'm talking about church this morning, I'm not talking about this facility we are in. I'm talking about when we gather. Now, God is everywhere but we meet him somewhere. And that is why we meet up somewhere. We can meet up in a physical building. We can meet up online. But whenever we meet up, we are having church. So church is not a place. Church is what is going on when we gather. So this building is not the church. You and me... We are the church of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So the first thing I have said is that the church is not a place. The church is a people. Would you say that? So let me start by saying that Ephesians 5 verse 23 shows us that Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. I still don't understand why there are churches that ask people to leave, you know. You can be excommunicated from the church. 
You know, the point being made is that no pastor has the right to ask a Christian to leave the church because Christ is the head of the church. It is not my church. It is not your church. He said himself, I will build my church. Nobody owns the church. Christ is the head of the church. Second thing I want to say is that the church, which is all of us, and when I'm talking about all of us, I don't mean House of Grace members. I mean all of the church on the earth. In heaven, there will be no Church of God mission. There will be no Winner's Chapel. There will be no Christ Embassy. In heaven, there will be no Catholic or cherubim and seraphim. We all are just one church. And all of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we are the church. We differ doctrinally, but fundamentally, we are all one church. There are some things we disagree on, and it doesn't mean that anyone is less Christian than the other. I mean, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see how that they told the same stories differently. Peter and Paul had arguments among themselves. They differ doctrinally, but fundamental to us is that we are Christian, and as a church on the earth, Christ is our head. Praise God. Now, if I say that Christ is the head of the church, that means that the church becomes the world. Oh, you are not with me this morning. If Christ is the head, then we as the church, we become the? So the church is called the body of Christ. So you and me and every other Christian, we are parts of this body. We are Christ is the head. So we are jointly knitted with Christ as the body. And you must understand it that way because if Christ is the head and you are the body, you must understand where you draw inspiration from. You would see that Christ without us, you know, it, there is not much to say. And we without Christ too, there is also nothing much to say. I mean, a bodiless head is as useless as a headless body. Christ is the head, we are the body. So without us, Christ no longer has value. And without him, we no longer also have value. So what we are doing here is partnership. That's what I'm explaining this morning. Are you in church now? So Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Why is the church called body? as in a body. This earth, God made it and gave to man. Man is a spirit that has body, right? Now, when Jesus left this earth, he told us that he will not leave us like orphans. He said he will send his spirit to be with us. You know, when we talk about Jesus today, the man Jesus is not physically present on the earth. The man Jesus is functional on the earth as a spirit. And spirits don't have the right to operate on this earth without a body. That's why in the Garden of Eden, Satan, who is a spirit, came through the body of a serpent. Spirits operate on the earth with a body. So if the Holy Spirit must operate on this earth that we are in, he will operate through a body called the body of Christ, which is you and me. Meaning that without the church, there is no platform for the spirit to manifest on the earth. Are you seeing this? That's why it is written that the earnest expectation of the creature is waiting for the manifestation of those of us through whom the Spirit manifests. Because we are the ones that carry the spirits of God being the church. Praise God. So, when you came to church this morning, you came with the spirits of God. Why? Because you are the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18 you are part of the body of Christ. And he is the head of the body. What is that body? The church. Who is the head? Christ. 
So we have established that when you come to church, you don't come to meet God in church. You bring God to church. So when people have accused us, why do you use your church hall for an event? And people are drinking alcoholic beverages here. We'll say to them that this place is not the church. We are the church. This place is not the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. You know, this problem did not start today. It began with Jesus. Jesus himself said, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. They carried stones. They were almost going to kill him. They said, how can you say that you will build in three days this temple that took Solomon, our father, many years to build? They kept on thinking the temple of God, the church, was a building. But Jesus was referring to himself. He was referring to his body. He was saying, if you kill me, I would resurrect on the third day. So, in our time, we still have the majority thinking that way. So there is a special altar, right? People kneel on the altar. That's why we had to remove that cross here. Let people come and start praying before it, okay? Because you think, <laughs> and I don't trust some of you, you understand? Once the person you are owing calls you, you come and lie down here. <laughs> I heard the story of a boy who asked his father to buy him a bicycle. The father said, pray to God to give me the money. He prayed and prayed. His father didn't buy it. He went back to his dad. Why haven't you bought me the bicycle? The father said, I've not gotten the money yet. Pray to God. And the boy came up with an idea. He ran to the nearest Catholic church close by and saw an effigy of Mary and quickly stole it and went back to his room and said, God, if you don't give me my bicycle, you won't have your mama. <laughs> and that's what we think. Okay? So you won't. Anyway, that's a story for another day. So the point is, there is no special altar here. You see this place, the reason why it is high is not because it's St. Simonos. It's just so that those at the back can see the front. Understand? So when children run all over this place, it's a stage. The altar is in your heart. And if you have a special place in your house where you go to kneel at, Okay, after a while, psychologically, you will attach feelings to the place. When you go there to pray, you will feel spiritual, and then you begin to deify a place. But you see, God is too big to be confined to a place. God is mobile. We carry the mobile presence of God. So when we meet, give more emphasis to yourself as the body of God, as the temple of Christ, rather than just the place. Praise God. So, let me enter into this teaching by saying, God builds through people. In this earth, God is building a house, and he builds through people, me and you. God builds through people. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible refers to us as lively stones. Meaning that me and you are the brick and mortar that God is using in building. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, the Bible says you are God's building. So God is building a structure on the earth, all right? So he says you are God's building. So he's building with me and you as bricks and mortar, okay? So when we come together, to form the body of Christ, we become different parts of a big, gigantic structure that God is raising on this earth through which he wants to show himself. So, there is no ordinary service. When I'm talking about there is no ordinary service, I'm not talking about coming to Ambi Royal Marquis. I'm talking about coming around when we gather. Because when we gather, I would tell the benefits of coming to church, there is no ordinary service. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Hebrews 10 25, the, the scripture says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's not about coming to a place. 
it is that whenever we gather, there is something about it. Because when we gather, healings take place. All right? And we will talk about this. Coming to church does not help God. Coming to church helps you. Because when you are coming, in terms of we are meeting each other to do whatever we do, you are the one who is better for it. It does not help God, it helps you. You can't be a Christian and neglect the assembling. If you really love God, one of the ways to know that you love God is that whenever we gather, you are excited about it. Let me tell you about a man who loves God so much. The Bible called him a man after God's heart. His name is David. This is what he said. He said, I was glad. Psalm 122 verse 1. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. At that point, they still saw it as a physical building. Now we see it as we go in to present ourselves as the blocks and the cement for what God is building. And we must not take it lightly. I am beginning to know why God took special interest in David. With all of his weaknesses as we all have, David did not joke, all right? David did not joke with going to church in their own time. This is what David will say. Psalm 69 verse 9, the zeal of your house have consumed me. Meaning, the zeal of your house have eaten me up. I am now addicted to going to church like it is me breathing. I know religion will now take this person out. All right? But look at this in the lights of the New Testament. It means that whenever we gather, it must be taken very sacred. Whenever we gather, it must be taken personally. As a matter of fact, you know, in the early church, they had service every day. In the time of Paul, every day was church. And that was New Testament, by the way. You can check it up in Acts 2, verse 47. The Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily, not weekly. Meaning that they had services every day. And we, in our generation, we get lazier for coming twice a week to sharpen each other and do what we do as a gathering of people. When the archbishop was alive, there were services every day in Faith Arena. Meaning, all right, that Christianity is not what you do on Sunday and forget it to the next Sunday. Even this Sunday is a struggle. The point is not about coming to a place, it's about hooking up to fellow Christians. Are you following what we are saying? Show me Psalm 119, verse 139. This is the same statement from the same guy. My zeal has consumed me. And we saw before that he said that zeal was the zeal for the house of God. You cannot love God and neglect when his children gather. You cannot love God and three weeks you have not hooked up into any service and you are still fine. I am not trying to be legalistic or to bring you back to religion. You know, sometimes when we try to say we don't want to raise religious people, we now end up raising lazy people who just think we don't have to go to church and everybody is fine. If everybody who is a Christian thinks that way and sleeps in their house on Sunday mornings, then you will be frustrating God's plan. The Muslims take it religiously. And that is why five times a day or so, they must meet to pray. Regardless of the, of the whiteness of the shirt of that Muslim guy who is in his office. 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, he will go and join the fellow local Muslims. 
by the roadside and stay on top of a mat and prostrate without thinking of class. That is what it should be. Church actually should be a classless community. So regardless of whether they are at the top cadre in Nigeria level, when it comes to their religious activity, they don't care. But because we preach grace, people have taken it to the extreme to mean licentiousness. Licentiousness now means you think you don't have to do anything at all. Yes, it is true that you don't have to pray for God to accept you. But does that mean you should not pray at all? No. It is true that you don't have to come to a physical church to make heaven. But does that mean you should not go to church at all? No. There is an extreme of grace. And a real good teaching must draw the balance. Are you following what I'm saying? I am not saying you should feel bad on the Sunday morning when work does not legitimately let you come to church. But I am saying that whenever you can, and most of the times you can, you must not forsake the gathering together of fellow Christians. Show me back Hebrews 10 verse 25. You must not forsake it as the manner of some is. You see, he said it that way. He said as the manner of some is because in those days too, they had Christians who took it lightly. So let's say they want to go to church and there was a football match. They stay back at home. We are not religious here. If we realize that most of our members will be watching a particular football match on a particular service day, we will say, come to church, let's watch the match here. And after here, we will get into a service. But we have gathered. The point is that we met each other. Are you seeing? Because something happens when we gather. What happens? It's exalting one another. And you need this for your life's sake. Okay? Something happens when we gather that must not be taken lightly. That must not be taken lightly. Praise God. Okay. Since I've entered into that, let me just say this and get into this and make the point. Why must we have to gather together? Why do we do church? Why do we do church? Why must we come here every Sunday? Number one is what you are seeing. Forsake, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but doing what? Exalting one another. So in church, why do we gather? We gather to exalt one another. Because every time you tell somebody else, God bless you, the person actually God blessed. We exhaust one another. Every time we meet each other and we say, how are you? You exhaust one another. Or you say a scripture that energizes the person. Okay? We gather to exhort. So the point number one is that we do church because iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27 verse 17. Iron sharpens iron. That Old Testament scripture simply means that when we gather together, we exalt each other, exalt one another. So because of you, I get smarter. And because of me, you get smarter. We exalt one another. I am using a secular word, smarter, but it actually means we, we get more sensitive spiritually. Are you still there? So we exalt one another. See, let me tell you this, and it is the truth. If you say I am being legalistic, I did not write the Bible. The less you attend church services, the more you fall into sin, period. Okay? Who said that? The Bible. All right? The less you go to church and associate with fellow Christians, the more your tendency is to do wrong. Check yourself every time you misbehaved. You would realize that those were the periods where you were not in the fellowship of other Christian friends. You know the good things about being with fellow Christians? We can secularize. We are still normal people. But me and you as Christians, even though we are normal people, we do what the world will do, but we know our boundary. And that is why 
growing up as a young boy, all of my, all of my, what is the word now? All of my leisure has been in church, right? I'm not saying you must be like that, but I would rather attend a dinner party that is organized by church than for me to go to a club somewhere where I don't have practicing Christians. Because when I am in the midst of fellow Christians, even though we are being secular, dancing and all of that, I trust that they have the Holy Spirit in them and they know their boundaries. I trust that nobody will go naked. I trust that nobody will take the freedom to now get captivated again into sin. But I cannot trust that when I am doing it in the midst of unbelievers. You are safer when you secularize with Christians. I am not saying the secular is bad. That's why I prefer secular songs written by Christians. I am not one of those who think that you must only sing gospel song, you know, because when we say that legalistically, for somebody to now be accepted into the mainstream as gospel music, they will now change baby to Jesus. So you were singing, I love you, baby, and then you change it to I love you, Jesus. But you are still thinking of the same thing, all right? And I've seen people um, take a very nice secular song and try to Christianize it, okay? I heard somebody singing Westlife, and oh, my love, and oh, my God. I said, what is happening here, okay? Because when you are saying, as a matter of fact, the old church was singing with him, but we all knew we were singing, and oh, my love. We didn't even have them. Our mouth was saying, God. Our heart was saying, baby. So it is not even about the secular. What we are saying is, I prefer a Christian write a secular song. It will be cleaner. There will be no vulgar words. It will be a song about love and life and about national development. All right? Like so many of them that we admire, like Just Faithful. Yeah. Where is she? You'll be paying me for this. Are you there? So that is the point. When we come to church, we can do secular things. When we come to church and we dance and we do all of that, or maybe we have a comedian come to church, those are secular. If a comedian is talking comedy in church, he's not spiritual, all right? But we, we prefer secularizing with fellow Christians because we know the limits. You see this? When people tell me, do you allow secular songs as a Christian, all right, I say yes. Now, and I ask people, you don't listen to secular songs, but you watch secular movies. Or do you think the football you watch is spiritual? You don't listen to secular songs, but you go to a secular school. Or you think your university is spiritual. Those things are in the secular. What does that have to do with the kingdom? But the point is that a Christian knows how to save. So you are the one that said, okay, this can go, this cannot go. This is too dirty, this is cleaner for someone of my type. Are you getting the point? That is how to grow. So in church, iron sharpens iron. In church, all right, when we say iron sharpens iron, we exhort each other. And the more we do that, the less we we'll sin. Number two, why must you be in the gathering of believers? The answer is that you cannot practice Christianity in isolation. That's a message all by itself. You cannot practice Christianity in isolation. You cannot fit. Even in the animal kingdom, when the predator comes to take a prey, the predators target those animals which are solitary, the ones that move alone. As strong as the lioness is, she will not go for animals that are gregarious, as in they are walking in a herd, because a herd of weak animals can overpower just one strong animal. So when you are doing life alone as a Christian, the enemy comes for you. Because you are alone. That's why God told them, it is not good for a man to be alone. You use that only for marriage. It also means in your Christian work. 
you can't afford to do life alone. Even God himself, a whole God, he was going to create man. He said, let us, let us make man. God did not say, I will make man or let me make man. He said, let us. You can't do Christianity alone. Are you still here? You can't do Christianity alone. Number three, why do we go to church? Why do we gather together? We gather together for spiritual partnership. Spiritual partnership. Have we ever been in a problem before? And you need someone to pray with you. That is called spiritual partnership. If there is nobody in your church that you can call and say, pray with me on this matter, then something is wrong somewhere. You must have people like that. And very soon in this church, we will, we will give out a line that people can call for prayers and counseling as the case may be. Because we do not, we do not all right, think that everybody does not need that. Some people will need that. And when you need that, you deserve, listen, the strongest of people sometimes need someone to pray with them. I remember the morning in church where I was in the Sunday service like this. All right, years ago I was called and my mother slumped in the, in the church. All right, I left the service and I began traveling immediately. Okay, but while I was leaving, I told Dickness Ann, I told Damol, I think I told you, Pastor Mercy, Lewis, you know, I said, be praying about this. As a matter of fact, while I was going, I called one person, I said, hope you are still praying. I was stressing the guy, make sure you don't stop praying. Or I keep praying till I arrive. Okay? That's spiritual partnership. And of course, I got there and I sensed the devil parking. Because if he's the devil, it's easier. Just tell him, get out. Okay? And she was fine. But just imagine I have to carry all of that load alone on me. And of course, as a leader, I still need to do my leadership duties and make sure things are working in church before leaving. But nobody knows there is this pain and this yoke in me. And every Christian needs this. I don't care if you're a pope or an archbishop or a pastor. You need someone sometime you can pray with. The Bible says that one shall chase a thousand. But two shall chase what's talk to me. Meaning that something happens when you have someone that you can hold together and pray. Imagine God's mathematics. One, you chase a thousand. Two, ten thousand. What happens when we are hundred? Are you following what we are saying? This is benefits of a church. So you mustn't take it lightly. The Bible says, if any two or three shall touch and agree, whatever they bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So if I hold hand with a fellow Christian in church, the person does not even need to know what I am praying for, for the person to agree with me. And guess what? When we bind it on earth, it will be bound in heaven. God says amen to it. When we lose it on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. You must, and that is why in the church you must belong to small groups where you have one or two persons, all right, that you can always say, I am trusting God for this, but praying for me on this. And I will talk about this at the end of service. When someone confides in you about a challenge and we are partnering together spiritually, that's when you must grow. Meaning that your best friend must not know what I am telling you to pray about. Are you seeing because many people have been hurt in church. I will end with that. Let me leave that for now. Why do we gather together? Why do we do church? Now, notice my change of vocabulary. I'm no longer saying why do we go to church. Because it's not a place, right? I'm saying why do we what? Do church. Number next, I should be number four, is to minister unto God. To minister unto God. Did you know we can actually minister unto God? I'll tell you how. Show me Acts 13, verse 2. Acts 13, verse 2. This was before they sent out Paul and um, Barnabas, I think. And as they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, 
This was the church. They came together and they ministered unto God and fasted. The Holy Spirit spoke. So, so he speaks. But that happened when they ministered unto the Lord. What does it mean to minister unto the Lord? You minister unto the Lord every time you join praise and worship. Every time you join praise and worship, your emphasis should not be on the person singing. Your emphasis should be that you are ministering unto the Lord. It's not about you are looking at them. You raise your hand. See, you are ministering unto God. Even the persons leading you in songs are also ministering unto God. So skill is good, but it is beyond skill. It's about spirits now. And that is why, you know, in those days, how churches began. We, you know, if you've been a Christian long enough, churches started with, you know what I mean? Two or three are gathered, and then we start clapping. There's this popular song, we are gathering together unto the, all right? Most churches began as fellowships. There are many redeemed branches that began as fellowships. It didn't matter whether they were on key or off key. They didn't need instruments, nowhere condition, all right? But they ministered unto the Lord. There are people in their churches, the floor is not as neat as this, but they lay all out and minister unto God. But when we are doing worship, some of you are conscious about what you are wearing. Some of you are even thinking about what you will eat when you get home. Especially students. I remember once I was like that. I was in fellowship on campus, and I remembered I did not want my beans. Oh, my. And that was all I had to eat. My heart filled me. And I prayed. I said, Father, if you keep these beans... <laughs> Maybe you are like that now. As I'm preaching, you're not thinking of what I'm saying. You know, I got back to the hostel and the beans did not spoil. You see, there are little things that have made us to trust in God. No matter what, no matter what happens, you can't talk me out of trusting God. Because if he could take care of beans, he can take care of me. But stop thinking. All right, you know, the Bible actually said, take no thoughts. What you shall eat, drink, or wear. All right? So when you come to church, your attention must shift to what is going on. There is something called ministering unto God. I know people who are so spiritual, they only go to church to hear the message. But you don't know that that message, you can listen to it again within the week. But there is something about corporate worship. There are over 3 billion Christians on earth. So imagine you being one of those on this Sunday morning who join the rest of the angels, lift up your hands and worship God. Corporate worship, that is ministering unto God. See, do you know that when we, when we raise our hand during praise and worship, we are doing something? Show me Psalm 141 verse 2. It says, let my prayer be set forth before thee as what? Incense. That's why we don't burn incense in Pentecostal churches. It has changed. As a matter of fact, those who burn incense now are attracting demons. Yes, tell your neighbors. Let my prayers be set forth before thee as incense. When you pray, you are releasing incense to God. You are feeding the heavens. But see my emphasis, the next line. And the lifting up of my hands as the what? Evening sacrifice. Those people who keep pots at junctions and polluting the Bini environment. If only they know this. You don't have to offer any sacrifice. Just lift up your hands to minister unto God. That is sacrifice enough. When you go to Timothy, Paul he said it. He said, I will that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without rods. Okay. So that is ministering unto God, corporate worship. When we sing together, when we dance together, I like American churches, they would teach all of them the song. Everybody takes their paper and they sing the hymns, all right? The Baptists and the Methodists still do that, all right? Who will sing along to minister unto God, okay? And that is why when we are singing, we must be conscious of it. 
all right? And we would make sure that when we are singing songs that are not in the language everybody understands, it will be transcribed, Pastor Femi. Okay? It will be transcribed so that people will be seeing the meaning of what they are saying. Because it is hard for me to worship saying what I don't understand. Right? You know, little things that matter. Once upon a time, I was in the church and somebody walked up to the pastor and said, I'm not coming to this church anymore. The pastor said, why? She said, I have realized that they only sing Yoruba songs in this church. See, that's marginalization. Okay, and this was in Lagos. Meaning something that small, but because this person wanted to hear their own dialect. Okay, so better, all right, you sing what everybody can follow it so that we all can minister unto God. In church, we minister unto God corporately, and apart from singing and worship, we minister unto God by giving offerings. Church is an opportunity for you to give offerings. That is another way to minister unto God. The Bible said, Exodus chapter 23, verse 15, says you must not come before God empty-handed. Think about it. As a principle, you don't come before a great man empty-handed. So when we gather in the name of the Lord, all right, the last line, and none shall appear before me empty. Okay? I'm not saying if you don't have money, you should not come to church. But I'm trying to teach you that when you know this, you start planning from the week. When I, when I have a minty note, I keep it for offering, meaning I'm planning for the weekend. You understand? It is not during offering time. You start looking for just anything. You plan it. If I give 1,000 euros an offering on a Sunday morning, in a month, I give just 4,000. That is not too much. You plan it because you are coming to minister unto God, and you must come with a seed. And as you grow in life, you must, you must increase your offering, how you minister unto God. Let's say as a student, you used to give 15 naira. Now you are working, you now increase it to 17 naira. That's you are defining the speed of your own growth. Okay? When you are ministering unto God, you must, you must minister in your offerings. All right? Let me not talk about tithing. That is a message all by itself. Let's have in the year we will study on the economics of tithing. So we come to church to minister unto God. And then why else do we come to church? Why else do we do church? We come together to confirm prophecy. To confirm prophecy. So when the pastor says this week is your week, you are not shouting amen because it's the pastor saying it. You are shouting amen because it's a confirmation. You have already known <coughs> that this week is your week. Are you there? See, there is not an individual that has exclusive rights to God. So when somebody on the podium on stage gives you a prophecy, it, what happens in church is you should be saying, yes, I thought about this. You should be saying exactly what I thought about. So the person says this week, all right, and gives a word of knowledge, whatever they call it, there should be confirmation. It must resonate in your spirit because you also carry the spirit of God. If the pastor tells you something and it does not resonate with your spirit, no matter who the person is, you have every right, okay, to trash it. Because, like Rebono Sass, we say, he will say he is not quarreling with God. Why will God leave him and speak to you to tell him? You get what I'm saying? So if God must tell you something to tell me, it must be something I'm also thinking that God is telling me. But if it does not follow, all right, it must not be taken. And people must be taught this way. When Jesus died, the veil of the temple tore into two from top to bottom. What does that mean? Everybody now had access to God. So it is not your pastor that will tell you who to marry. You understand? you hear for yourself. We are raising weak people in church. I once preached a message titled Assumed Powerlessness. And I spoke about Adam. Who, who, who was the marriage counselor that counseled Adam before he, went, before he accepted Eve as his wife? 
Who was the person that sold him? I think if you are Adam, you didn't want to have a choice. <laughs> there was no one else. You don't get what I'm saying? Imagine the whole world, the whole world, just, just something happens and everybody dies and there is just one guy and one girl left and the guy walks up to the girl and says, I love you. And the girl is still feeling romantic. She's foolish. Because when he says, I love you, she said, of course. There's no other person. <laughs> the sooner we start loving, the better. <laughs> Praise God. What happens in church should be a confirmation of prophecy. So whatever they are saying, yes. Show me 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. Thank you. God is not the author of confusion. Okay. Um, I'm going, okay, show me verse 29. Go up, verse 29. Let the prophet speak. Two, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other do what? Scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, all right, there shall be confirmation. So in church, even if there is a prophet and the person is speaking, somebody must judge. He that is spiritual judges all things, but is not judged of any man. All right? As he is speaking, there must be confirmation. Okay, now, that was why the other verse we saw, he says, God is not author of confusion. That, that came up because in the early church, once somebody stands up to prophesy, somebody else will say, yes, that is it. I, 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 I caught that in my spirit. When somebody stands up to speak in tongues, somebody will say the interpretation of the tongues. And that was how it was, confirmation. But then, all right, the women took over. And you know, women don't easily establish boundary. I'm sorry. So what happened was that everybody began to prophesy. So I'm preaching now. Somebody is shouting. The other person is shouting. And that it was on the basis of that, Paul now said, let women not speak in church. <laughs> have you heard that before? Have you, have you heard churches or seen people who say that it's not biblical for women to preach? They are coming from that perspective. But what they don't know is that the context for Paul saying women should not preach was not because they were women, but because there was confusion. Imagine I'm preaching now, you're speaking in tongues, somebody else is shouting. That was where Paul now said, God is not the word, author of confusion. He now said, let the women learn in silence. They should ask their husbands at home to teach them. Because it is easier, you know, and it happens a lot all the time. Somebody is leading prayer, and the person says, in Jesus' name. And somebody is still going, ah, ah, ah. he says, in Jesus' name, second time, you are, you are still in the spirit. You can't stop. And when you tell us you can't control it, then we should be skeptical what spirits you are praising by. You understand? Because the spirit of a prophet is what? Subject to the prophet. God is not the author of confusion. When they say in Jesus' name, you shut up. You keep on going on and on and on and on. That was, that was what was happening in the early church. So it was the women. Paul will be preaching. Somebody else is preaching. One woman will start speaking in tongues over there. He is still preaching. Somebody else is holding her head like this. You know how some do it? Don't try that at home. Okay, you roll your head this way, somebody else is there interpreting, but a message is going on. And so the church was in disarray. And he told the husbands, teach your wives at home, let women not speak in church, because God is not the author of confusion. So the context is, in church, what happens is that there must be a confirmation. And whatever you are doing, all right, there must be orderliness. Are you there? So imagine as I'm speaking now, someone raises the hand to ask question, and it's not time for question. And you insist you must ask. We'll leave the church for you. <laughs> Find me in Ecclesiastes, where the Bible says that when you come to church, you must keep your feet. Is that Ecclesiastes 5? Please help me. Just a second, I'm sure I'll find it. They have removed my Ecclesiastes. Sorry? Five, five? It's up. Thank you. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. In those days, like I said, they used to see it as a place. You understand? 
So the point is that there must be orderliness in church. That is the point. He says, keep thy foot. You can't be walking up and down and disrupting things, all right? Keep thy foot. You can't be in front and your phone is ringing and all of that. Keep thy foot, okay? He says, keep thy foot. There should be orderliness to a large extent. Are you there? I will talk about that in a short while, okay? In the place of love and all of this. But in church, there must be orderliness, all right? And there must be confirmation. Now, let me ask you something. As I'm teaching now, the things I'm saying, is it agreeing with your spirit? Talk to me. Now, you know, if it is not, either I am wrong or you are wrong. But one thing is sure, if you are born again, you have the spirit of God. There must be resonation. No pastor has the right to impose their thoughts on you. You understand? There must be confirmation. It must come from within. You just agree. Why do we do church? What happens when we do church? Um, you will like this one. We do church for the sake of being physically touched. What does that mean? That means that in church, somebody will shake your hand, somebody will hug you, somebody will touch you physically in the most godly way. Somebody say emphasis. You are a better preacher. Who is that person? Let me give you the mic. Jesus himself, you know, I noticed Jesus. In the Bible, all of the people whom Jesus healed, who were women, he touched them physically. All right? The woman who was bent, he touched her. One other woman tried to touch her so much, she could only come close to his cloth, and she touched the hem of his garment. There was, there was a physical contact. He wasn't that fair to men. To the men, he will spit on the ground. <laughs> now I use the soil and put on their eyes. Come on, that's gender discrimination. <laughs> All right? The women, he will touch them. All right? The men, he will say, go and wash in the pool of silver. Or what do I have to do with you? He was, he was more harsh to the men. Follow the conversation. But so the women, he will say, ah, daughter of Abraham. He touched her. All right? He was nicer to them. It has been said that you need four hogs per day as an antidote for depression. You need eight hogs per day for mental stability. And you need 12 hogs per day for real psychological balance. If I catch you again. <laughs> this is what happens when we come to church. All right, somebody hugs you, somebody loves on you. When you get back home, go and research it. In the 13th century, King Frederick of Germany did an experiment. He wanted to know the language that children speak naturally when they are born, when they come from heaven. He wanted to know the language they speak. He wanted to know the language Adam and Eve spoke to each other. And so he commanded that they should bring newborn babies to him. They brought newborn babies to him, uh, forgotten the number. He asked that, you know, he told the nurses, feed them. All right, just give them their food, water, and all of that, but don't cuddle them, don't peck them, don't have a physical contact with them. After a few weeks, all the children died. That shows how much human beings need physical touch to survive. So he did not actually get to actualize the points of his experiments. He wanted to hear the language they would speak without being spoken to, but he also added that they should not be touched, and they all did not make it. When we come to church, there must be a touch. But the point is that when you touch, don't stick. Whatever that means to you is what I'm saying. And then what's more? My handwriting is so bad, so I'm trying to see what I wrote. The way you are laughing, you want to preach? <laughs> Remember what we said, all darliness. Eh? If I was Elijah, I would just command lions to come and eat you. You know how it happened. Okay, so lastly, when we do church, what happens is that we get strengthened. Show me Psalm 84, verse 7. Psalm 84, verse 7. 
It says they go from strength to strength. All of them that appear before God in where? Zion. Zion is the Old Testament church. So whether we appear online or on sites, when we meet each other, we strengthen each other. How many of you, you have been heavy? Maybe you were a bit depressed or you had some issues going on and then when you just came to church, you felt lighter. You came heavy, you wore a long face, but after the service, you were all smiles and you felt better. Anybody like that, let me see your hand. What is going on is what happens in church. And, and listen, you must attend a church in which, regardless of what you have gone through all through the week, you are telling yourself, if only I just get to church on Sunday. You must attend a church in which, by Saturday, you are already anticipating, why can't Sunday just come fast enough? Because what happens is that as we exhort one another, sharpen each other, we are refreshed. We are strengthened. Depression is bound in church and joy is released. Joy is expressed. This is the necessity of being in church. This is the necessity of doing church. This is why we must connect with each other, one with another. Show me 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, please. First Corinthians 12, all right? So, it says that, For as the body is one, and has many members, all the members, that's, all the members of that one body, being many, our one, whatever that means. Our one body, so is Christ, okay? Show me, I think in this same chapter, where he was talking about the fact that we are different members of the same body. So when we come together, we network, all right? When we come together, we connect, we intertwine. And with that, we'll become formidable. That is what happens in church. Are you still there? Now, let me end by saying that a church is a church regardless of the size. Scripture says where two or three are gathered. And the truth of the matter is, especially, okay, thank you, just leave it there. Especially in the Nigerian church, when you see churches that have a um, large crowd, a big church has the tendency of becoming a great church. But not all big churches are great churches. And God does not measure our success as a church based on our number. Even though we should aim at having larger numbers because that will mean we are churching up the earth. Are you there? There's a parable in the Bible whereby a man sends his, um, his servants all right, to go and invite his guests for the party. His guests did not show up, and then at the end of the day, he told them, go into the streets, call just anybody. He said, compel them to come. And that is why if you see the biggest churches in Nigeria, you will see that the average members are base people. Okay? So if you want, depending, we are house of grace. We are, we are called to some particular people. All right? There are no heirs to what I am saying, but you will agree with me that it will be very difficult for somebody who does not understand English or somebody who is very uneducated to flow with the teachings coming from here, especially with Reverend Osas. You understand? Meaning, all right, that we are not called to everybody. But if we want to fill up everywhere, it's very simple. Let's now go for anybody. Because the biggest churches, you go there, you see market women, all right, and base people. People are the lower strata of the ladder. 
Because that was what happened in that parable. They sent them to the streets and they said, just call anybody. If you read that story in the Bible, even when they now came dressed tatterly, he now began to kill them. But you invited them. He now told them, many are called, few are chosen. Because why would you come to my party dressed like this? So the point I'm making is that a small church can still be a great church. Whether it is big or not, but every church must go on to becoming big. And research has shown that every church that has grown grows on two platforms. Number one is that the members invite other members. Mouth-to-mouth invitation is not, it is much more effective even than evangelism, going to the streets to talk to nobody. So you invite somebody. Somebody wants to see you. You say, oh, the easiest way to find me is in church. Come on Sunday. And then the second platform upon which church goes is that they utilize the first time as quickly. So as they come in with their energy and their zeal and they admire the choir, they should join. When they admire whatever, they should start participating. That is how churches are built. Maybe in this country, it will be probably Christ Embassy that is a large church with highly intellectual individuals who are captains of industry and all of that. Okay, the other major churches, all right, you, you know the ones your parents attend probably. So the point we are making is that you can be impactful as a church regardless of where you are in the scheme of things. That you are not seeing me on all of the social media does not mean that the church is not impactful because you are the church. And if all we can do as a church is to impact all of us that are here, we have succeeded. We mustn't be known globally. And if we can be known globally, fine. But I'm telling you that if all we achieve as a church is to raise just you, one person, then we are already a success. Only evangelist believes, no problem. You'll believe later. So, now let me say this. It is very possible that people get hurt in church. Okay, fine. It is very possible that people get hurt in church because where two or three people are gathered, there must be quarrel. It does not mean that we are less spiritual. I heard a story recently, and this is where love comes in because, see, Jesus said offense will come. He said it himself. So if somebody offends you in church and you stop coming to the church, you are a baby, it means that you thought you were coming for the person. I had a story very recently. A man was in church sitting on the front seat, and he didn't know unknowingly his phone rang. Rang so loud and disturbed the service. Just like when I said we must be orderly, right? And his wife all right, rebuked him. Couldn't you put the phone on silence? All of the members turned and looked at him harshly, all right? Rebuked him, all of that. The pastor on the stage turns the man into his next message. Say, signs of the end time. When you start using phone in church. You know, everybody rebuked him. The man felt so bad. Out of his depression, going home, he walked into the nearest beer parlor and tried to drown his frustration in alcohol. The bartender brought him a bottle of beer. He popped it open. And because he was still lost in thought, he forgot himself and his hand hit the bottle of beer and it spilled, spilled on him and some other people. He quickly shrugged because what happened in church is going to happen again. And then the next person said, ah, boss, no worry, now so it be. The bartender said, oh, God, no worry, that one on me, come and take another one. And every other person there showed the opposite of what he got in church. Now you know his new church. You know his new church, all right? Mama, whatever, uh, reviver ministries. So what am I trying to say? And let me say it clearly. 
If somebody dresses the way they are not supposed to dress and walk into this church, you don't have the right to tell the person you are not properly dressed. Am I saying people should dress the way they, are, they want to dress? I am saying people should wear what they have. You know, I realized that most people who dress poorly, the clothes they wear was actually given to them by their older ones. So, you saw the lady dressing so poorly, all right, but maybe that was the clothes she inherited from my older sister. And that's how most people survive. And then you tell her you should not be wearing this to the house of God. And then you make the person walk away. And what you have told the person is that you can wear it on the streets, be bad in the streets, but pretend in church. And that is what the old school does. What we are saying is, show off your worst in church. We would help lovingly so. And by the way, nobody has the right. Listen, I said it two months ago. If an usher were to tell somebody poorly dressed, why are you dressed like this? Okay? And makes the person feel bad. You know? Because if this, was, if this were to be work, that person coming in is supposed to be my client. And you are not telling the person to go out because he's improperly dressed. The reason why you are a hypocrite is that where you do your business, when somebody comes to buy something from you, you don't look at their dressing. You just sell. You are concerned about change. Okay? But in church, you are looking all around because you are expecting people to be perfect before they come into church. But this is where they are meant to be perfect. So they should wear what they have. And your duty is not to be looking as the person, one kind. Your hands are up, but your eyes are like this. You worship a little bit. You say, ah, ah. You look at it. You know, what you are doing is that you are trying to become an assistant Holy Ghost. So you are marking the attendance for those who are real practicing Christians. The point being made is that when you do that, you are hurting the body of Christ. And the church is the only place where we shoot our wounded soldiers. So let's say somebody gets pregnant out of wedlock, all right? We ask the person to leave the church, and we dehumanize the person. And we don't know how much God is dealing with the person on an individual level. Rather, let church be a place where people are loved, where people are hugged, where you look away from the weaknesses of others, where you pray for the people who hurt you, and where you dispense love to expand the purpose of Christ on the earth. God bless you, Pastor Nelson. I want you to look at the person by your side and tell the person, I am grateful sitting by your side this morning. Tell the person, I do not judge you. Say, I love you. Tell the person, you are the church. Say, I am the church. Together, we are the body of Christ. Put your hands together for Jesus. Grace isn't just a prayer you chant before taking a meal. It's the way we live. The Lord came to show me how crooked I am, but grace came to straighten me out. Hello, I'm Ostas of Barry Siagon, the senior pastor of House of Grace Benin, and I'm of Church of God Mission. Here, we liberate people from the bondage of religion through the gospel of grace that we teach, encouraging them to be all that God has called them to be. House of Grace is a dynamic worship center where lives are transformed in an atmosphere of love, friendship, and humility. We have seen troubled marriages restored. We have seen miracle babies to couples who are waiting on the Lord for children, birth of new businesses, and an undying passion to reach out to the unsaved for Jesus Christ. Come fellowship with us today and let Jesus make a difference in your life.
welcome to E3.